Hey folks, welcome to another episode of the Application Security Podcast. This is Chris Romeo. I am the CEO of Security Journey, and I am flying solo today uh, for a conversation about secrets management. And so I'm joined by Jeroen Willemsen, who has been with us before on the podcast to talk about security automation and CICD, which means he gets out of having to share his security origin story because you've already heard it. But we are joined by Ben DeHaan, uh, and this is Ben's first visit to the podcast. And so, Ben, we always start right off with hearing people's security origin stories. If there was a comic book about your security story, what would episode one or, or, or issue one contain? Oh, well, um, actually, I think it, it would be um, somewhere the, the medical guy turning to IT. Um, I always thought I wanted to be a doctor, um, but actually... I'd been interested in computers um, growing up, um, running my own game servers, et cetera, et cetera. So uh, eventually I find myself uh, writing my, my thesis. And uh, um, it, it was in a hospital setting, but instead of writing the thesis, I was looking at the print queues of doctors and you know, figuring all kinds of security issues within said hospital. So. Um, I thought, well, if I like this, why don't I just go and make a career out of it? So um, I found myself a traineeship in uh, security, specifically in the SOC SIEM area, combined that with my uh, medical informatics background uh, and moved into security development. So is that, do you have a focus on medical security now or what's your kind of where have you landed coming out of that, that world of a medical focused background? Yeah, I still like to contribute somehow to the field, but um, I think I'd say I'm all over the place when it comes to the, the, the sectors uh, that I work for right now. Um, obviously, I would like to bring the knowledge that I gained outside um, to the medical field in some way, but uh, I'm not limited to that one specifically. So now I'm curious about what uh, from what, what are the parallels between the, focusing on going down a, a path of becoming a medical professional versus a security professional. Are there any parallels that, that you saw as you kind of were going in that direction and then changed your focus a little bit? I think um, primarily this is an incident response. And um, actually there is the, the whole soft side of things. So the soft skills are, of course, really important when it comes to incident response, managing the people, uh, communicating accurately, consistently, um, and in a way that doesn't, you know, upset everyone and uh, let the incident response go down the drain entirely. And I find that very similar to being in like a, a first aid setting and tri triaging the initial things, uh, helping yeah, you know, people helping people. That's the, the thing, right? Uh, regardless of which tools you're using. And, and I can see that parallel between incident response and a medical professional saving somebody's life. Like they're going through the process, they're doing a lot of the same things, you know, different, different final goal, but I could see how the parallels between those, those kind of directions. So, um, yeah, it's great to hear that, uh, that you made that transition and, you know, one of the things that's always interesting about asking people this question is no one's ever given me the same answer in seven years of doing this podcast. Everybody has a different story and everybody comes from different perspectives. And that's what really makes our industry very unique and awesome because people are coming from different perspectives. So, all right. So your own at the la at the end of our last interview, after we hung up and stopped recording, we started, uh, I think we, we even mentioned, this, this other project that you were working on and kind of caught our attention. So tell us about this other project that you and Ben have been working on here, and then we'll get into the origin of the project, but let's define what the project is first. Yes, yeah, so Project uh, Oursprung Secrets is a uh, vulnerable application that is uh, designed to educate people about secrets management. So we basically show, uh, right now we have about 12 uh, uh, assignments, 
uh, or challenges actually, where you have to find a secret that has been hidden wrongly uh, in somewhere within the project, whether within a cloud environment or a Docker container or hard coded in the uh, application code itself or the configuration of the code. Um, and the idea is that um, while you're hunting for those secrets and you find them with tools that we help you to use or that we hint towards, we hope that people start thinking about, hey, if we can find a secret um, within the, this project, then now everybody can find my secret in my project as well. But the only difference is mine is a production project. So now I have to start working on it. Uh, Lisa, so it's basically about spreading awareness a bit. Um, as well as having some fun and games about different situations that we saw when it came to secrets management. And so what, what's the origin story of the project itself? That's one of the questions I ask every every person that comes on here with a particular project. I'm always curious, like, where was the moment, where were you, and what was the moment where you were like, we got to start a project to solve this this particular problem? So this actually started in 2000. 20 when I wanted to prepare a talk for all day DevOps, <laughs> which was about secrets management. And then I was like, okay, if I create a lot of slides, um, it doesn't make sense because uh, you need to have some sort of code to explain the problem. So it becomes um, tangible, uh, it becomes um, uh, sensible, something that becomes easy to understand basically. Um, so I back then I only had like seven examples, which shows why you shouldn't put it in Docker and not in Git, uh, not, not in Git directly. But those examples were very rudimentary. So if I would provide this to anybody without the slides, it just looked like uh, plain gibberish basically. But during the presentation, it sort of kind of like makes sense. That's also where Ben and I hooked up uh, together on this project because at some point I had some trouble and I was under a lot of time pressure because this is, of course, done in your spare time um, to uh, get some stuff working on the Kubernetes. And Ben said, hey, nice to make it work like that, but maybe you should try this and that. That might be easier. And voila, it was a lot easier to go, to run forward. Um, uh, and then, uh, well, the project went into slumber mode for uh, more than a year. And then at some point, uh, uh, time basically we uh, got a lot of questions again about secrets management and then we figured okay we should pick this up again but now pick it up seriously um, which also means try to make it an OWASP project so that we can persist it over time and possibly also uh, uh, transfer it to other leaders over time when uh, when we've maintained it for a while um, and that's where we're at right now. Okay so now that we have a perspective on the project and what you were what you were trying to do. Let's back up a little bit and talk about this secrets management problem in general. So I don't want us to assume that all of our listeners understand all the intricate details of the the problem that the vulnerable application is presenting. And so Ben, maybe you can give us some context or some perspective on let's talk about secrets management as a problem that exists across the world of technology. Starting out, you might want to um, yeah, if you have data you want to keep safe or access you want to keep safe, you need to manage these secrets somewhere. And obviously, um, that then brings us to the problem of how do you manage this? Eventually, this grows out of control, um, maybe from your small notebook or your password manager. You now have to uh, share things. Uh, maybe... Um, you have secrets that you don't even want to touch yourself at all. You mean uh, like sensitive data that you kind of want to protect in some way, or you want to um, scope to a very specific part of your organization. And um, this is where a lot of problems come in, like um, access management uh, in general and uh, the scoping, the, the the duration of the secrets. You don't want everyone to have the highest privileges all the time. You may want to uh, give that some temporality. Um, and especially for the, the automated systems, probably these things shouldn't be very long-lived either. Um, but now how do you rotate them? And do you have to go and all, update all your applications all the time? Things break. Um, if you rotate a secret maybe. So you have to build your application to deal with that. Uh, that's the, the the kind of problem space that we're operating in. And we often see that in those, uh, in that problem space um, that people try to make it work and then 
don't it when it works don't go further to um, refine and make it nice and make it secure so um it's it's not generally one of the sexy topics of information or application security in general so yeah. um we, we thought that this would need some addressing yeah and, and i'm just i'm chuckling a little bit because your your explanation of um you know people just get it work working and then, and then just kind of get back out of the way and say i'm not touching anymore like that seems like a, like half of cloud configuration you're like uh, it's working so just everybody step back and you know don't don't get too close to it don't touch it and so i can see how secrets management plays into that especially when you start to think about it as a discipline or a set of solutions that are um, you know, Amazon and, and Azure and Google Cloud. And, you know, everybody's got their own secrets vault kind of solution that's supposed to solve this. Uh, but they're not, you know, it's not like they're super easy to, to interact with and set up and whatnot. So, um, so let's, uh, you know, maybe you could take us through some of the pitfalls that we see in this idea of secrets management. Like, you know, we've mentioned a few like secrets and source code and stuff, but like, what is the entire body of, of, of problem areas that we could have? We've mentioned source code, we've mentioned cloud. What else is there? So the problem with um, where you can find secrets or pitfalls is basically all the type of lessons that we might have learned in information security actually apply to secrets management. So wherever you would have made a mistake in terms of access management, in terms of logging, in terms of um, uh, in terms of uh, misconfiguration, you'll find it again in a microspace of, uh, of secrets management. So the answer can become very broad, but at least the pitfalls that we saw uh, a lot, which are also uh, somewhat included and some will be added in the future, uh, are for instance, um, well, container, uh, part of an environment variable inside a container, um, uh, but then hard coded as part of the Docker file. <laughs> so not loaded in after, but directly exposed. Um, uh, code configuration, um, Kubernetes secrets, which are committed to Git, um, uh, um, misconfigurations if it comes to the secrets management solution, which is either on the access level or uh, at the other direction. And one that's particularly uh, coming by a lot lately and which we'll hopefully add soon to the challenge is um, uh, when it comes to the CI CD pipelines. So for instance, if you set up your uh, systems and nowadays we all try to do this with uh, continuous uh, uh, deployment, continuous integration the pipelines like um, solutions like GitLab, GitHub, or whatever the cloud providers provide. Um, and what we often see is that the secrets over there are not very well protected. So when we then um, uh, have some sort of public project from a company that wants to share their knowledge, then it becomes relatively easy to start. Um, extracting the secrets from the pipeline and move forward from there uh, towards any part of the infrastructure. And actually then at some places actually hit up the actual secrets in the infrastructure. So that's that's the one of the most recent things. Um, the other thing that's still lingering along is uh, the idea that if you compile something towards machine level code and then hit the secret in that compilation, then nothing will hurt. So in mobile, we see that happening still a lot that you have hard coded secrets in your mobile application, for instance. Um, and something that's still not completely killed, but not uh, overly uh, uh, abundantly available is, for instance, people hiding uh, secrets in their JavaScript frontend with some funny obfuscation, uh, which either sometimes just results in minification and sometimes in some sort of encryption as well. So there's a lot of different places that you probably just, I mean, you, you made me think of a couple of different areas that I wasn't even wasn't even top of mind as far as where secrets could be hiding within here. So I guess a, a little bit more of a, I'm going to, I'm going to step back to the 10,000 foot view for a second here before we dive into the specific challenges that are part of the, this, this OWASP project and which ones you guys want to point us towards and kind of walk us through. But, and Ben, I'll, I'll throw this question to you first and then your own, I'd love to get your take on this as well. But when you think about, when you think about like 2021, Okay, supply chain, software supply chain, everybody was thinking software supply chain, it was top of mind for everybody. Coming into the end of the year of 2021, it was all about logging. Hey, look, logging, we made it, logging is finally a big issue. Now, it was a big issue for not because of logging, but because of the, you know, various vulnerabilities in log4j. 
do where does secrets management fit into the mind of uh, of developers and appsec people like do you think people is do, do people see this as the same pri have the same priority for this problem that they do for software supply chain for you know vulnerabilities in uh third party components or do you feel like developers that you talk to do they see the problem do they do they acknowledge the problem or is this something that we have to really teach them? We have to, you just have to bring that right to the front of their mind. So Ben, what are your thoughts on that? Yeah, I'd say when I look at it, it's, it the results are mixed there. So um, sure, there might be teams out there uh, who are very mature and really look at secrets management as part of their threat model and uh, consider things like the, the blast radius of a secret and how long it lives and um, for instance, when the supply chain security thing comes along that they know that, okay, um, this part could be affected and now we have to rotate these and these and these secrets. Um, on the other hand, I think there is a lot of teams still at the, the, the very early stage of doing any secret management at all, um, where if some compromise would, uh, would show up, then probably the entire system would be compromised because they haven't scoped down their secrets um, to a specific blast radius. So um, once dev goes or once the, the CI CD pipeline goes, all environments go. Um, so I think there's a lot of people um, out at sort of kind of the extremes um, of, uh, of that maturity life cycle there. Okay. Yeah. That's, I, I can, I can definitely see that you own any, any other thoughts about that particular issue from your perspective, as far as what you've seen in talking to developers, talking to other security people, do people really understand this issue and, and know the gravity of it? Well, similar like Ben was saying, it's really, um, there's a really broad spectrum there. And the funny thing is that even the teams that really have this heavy focus on doing this well, sometimes forget to document some secrets and then we still get into trouble. Um, so even if you have a high focus on it, having a grip on it is still something else than, um, than, than being aware of the problem, basically. So in terms of awareness, it goes all over the place. Um, some people that we've presented, for instance, the, these challenges to, to get, gain some feedback, were like, okay, if, if I looked at your challenge and I don't see the problem, what's the problem? That's, that's okay, right? I mean, why was it a problem? Sure, that's where Truffle Hawk is used for to get a secret. But yeah, what's for challenge one, for instance? But why? Um, what's the problem? I do this all the time. <laughs> uh, where at the other end was, um, we got responses like, these first four challenges are silly. Nobody is doing this, right? Um, so yeah, um, uh, it's really all over the place. Mm. And that's also very nice about this project that you get, uh, you know, that without any um, commercial things attached, you can actually just talk about this and get a feeling for it without, and that's the nice thing about OWASP in general, that you can get a feeling for where are we at outside of what we already have seen in the field. So where did you, did, did you get some of these challenges from the real world? Like what, what, like what was the source of these challenges? Cause you just kind of, you mentioned it a little bit in passing in your last answer. And now I'm curious as to how did you mine the world, the internet to find these problems so that you could create real world challenges. So, um, uh, I've been in the field for a while and I done quite a few pen tests and I did quite a few security coaching type of gigs. And that's where we found most of these. There's one issue in GitHub where we put even more challenges in that are easy to implement at, to a certain extent, which we also saw in the wild, basically. Um, so till now it's all real life examples. Um, there's, um, there, there are also examples that we would love to add, but I don't think we have the resources to implement that correctly. So people can experience that and it becomes very convoluted and very, um, organization specific, let's just say. Um, uh, but yeah, most of it was just real, uh, real life experience basically. Okay. So let's, uh, let's explore a couple of these. So I'm going to ask you both the same question as far as which challenge is your favorite and, and since Ben came to the project after you, your own, I'm going to let him go first so that he can take the one that you probably were like, ah, oh, that was my favorite too. Come on. Uh, <laughs> but then we'll come back to you. You might have to fit it. Pick, you can't choose the same thing though. You might have to pick an alternative favorite. So Ben, what, what's your favorite challenge that that's in this, this project? 
Well, I, I would definitely say uh, that's challenge number 11, and that's probably what Jeroen was going to say as well. Um, yes. So what was challenge is, is um, it's very specific to cloud providers. Uh, so it's slightly different for each cloud provider, um, but they all boil down to the same issue, which is there is some kind of privilege escalation path and um, you have to get somewhat creative in getting the secret out since um, from the code, um, yeah, the, the, the code directly interfaces with uh, a specific cloud secrets management solution. So um, there's really without any like advanced debugging tools uh, running during, yeah, or in, within the program, there's no way of extracting this secret. So you have to get creative within the configuration of the cloud and um, run your own resource, assume a, a certain role or um, look at the, 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 the Terraform definitions of how we have implemented it and then um, figure out where the error is um, and you can escalate to some different part and figure out the secret mm. from there. So how are you simulating the cloud environment then? Is this just a, are you using a Docker container to kind of, or are you using live cloud connection? You know, like how, how are you, how are you doing this so that it's a more real world? So it's actually in a real cloud environment. It's deployed to either AWS uh, and then EKS or uh, GCP and then uh, EKS and uh, Azure AKS. Okay, so it's 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 real live cloud that you're where the challenges yep. are running. So you're it's not like smoke. There's no smoke and mirrors of like we're just making it look like it's working. Like you're actually in the cloud environment, you know, trying to extract the secret. Okay, yeah, that's cool. I like we like yep. that type of real world exposure. Um, that's something that I'm a big fan of. So you're on yet to think of another favorite challenge since Ben actually took yours. I could tell by the expression on your face that uh, he, he did take yours, but uh, so pick another one and kind of walk us through. All right. Uh, there's two challenges that are my next favorite, if I can address them both a bit. So the first one is challenge number three, where we have something hard coded into the side of a Docker file by means of an env, Docker env, and then we put a secret inside. The, uh, so what you have, so um, the way you have to attain that is go over the, the Docker um, uh, container image and find out what happened, whether through Docker inspect or just at Docker Hub, look at the different layers and you'll actually see the secret directly. The reason that this is one of my favorite challenges is because uh, a part of me that drove this project was actually my conscience. Because when I, at the very beginning, started to do some uh, infrastructure development, a colleague of mine asked, and I wasn't very active in security yet, uh, where do I put the secret? Where do I put the private key? And I was like, well, you shouldn't put it in code. Maybe you should put it in a container. And I've felt ashamed of that advice ever since. Of course, it has been corrected. Not a problem at all. But that sort of kind of made me feel guilty. So I really had to create this challenge and make sure that this was very clear as a bad idea. Um, the other challenge that I really like is challenge nine. Challenge nine is the first cloud environment related challenge where um, uh, you have to find a secret in Terraform state. So for those who don't know what Terraform is, so Terraform is one of the ways to do infrastructure as code. Um, and then you can use that to uh, uh, instruct certain APIs to do stuff in a generic fashion. And you can, for instance, instruct the cloud providers like AWS, Azure, and um, uh, Google, uh, GCP basically to um, uh, to uh, configure the cloud environment in a way through Terraform. Uh, but Terraform needs to do some state keeping because it needs to understand what's happening. And that's what's stored basically in the Terraform state. And now the nice thing is that uh, during a lot of pen tests, once we reach the Terraform state, we sometimes need to find the key to encrypt the secrets that is also stored in the same Terraform state if it's really in a bad position, or we just find the secrets directly, or sometimes it's really well done and we can't find squat. But often that's where we start our lateral movement because uh, with the Terraform state secrets, uh, we can have fun. Um, and that's a problem we see in so many places. So in order to fix this challenge, you have to have, of course, a cloud environment where you can deploy the stuff to. And then when you run the scripts as provided in the readmes of the project, um, uh, um, you basically end up with a Terraform state on your computer, which you can easily go through and then you will find some funny password, which is actually the solution to this problem. And 
this might sound very s- silly as in nobody's ever doing that, but till now, and I done a, quite a few pen tests, only had a customer or two that really didn't have a secret that wasn't uh, downplayable by them, basically, in Terraform state. Uh, so all the rest, we always found funny stuff. Yeah, I love the... I love the real world nature of what you're describing here. The fact that you've created these challenges that are not academic or, you know, that that have never, there's a chance they never happened in the real world or never could happen. You've taken things that are real world, real life, and you're, you're using this as an educational method to, to teach people though. So that's, that's really cool. And I was scanning the, uh, the OWASP wrong secrets project page here. And, um, I noticed one of the contributors was born, uh, Bjorn Kimenich. And so any thoughts about taking wrong secrets and, and providing, making it part of juice shop or in any way, or what are your thoughts there? Um, so, um, uh, we have ongoing conversations with Bjorn about, hey, would it be fun to have something similar, like for instance, a CICD challenge or something else? Um, and uh, um, uh, uh, but there is no uh, direct overlap at this point in time. Of course, if you look at the juice shop, they actually already have some similar um, uh, uh, challenges already out there. Like, hey, find something specific, find an API key for, or uh, something like that. But the focus for Juice Shop is quite different from uh, Wrong Secrets. For Juice Shop has a much broader audience, a much broader goal to attain. Yeah. We really try to um, stay focused in that sense, um, uh, which also shows in the way how the container is built. Uh, so we don't have some explicit vulnerable components inside. We try to actually maintain that a bit to not have those vulnerabilities in. Where Juice Shop is really about anything that can go wrong will go wrong. Um, so you can really learn from it in a broad sense, uh, 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 basically. Yeah. yeah, that makes sense. So one thing I want to make sure we do bef- as, as kind of as we start to conclude our conversation here is I want, to, I want to make sure you guys take a moment to give some advice to people who are using wrong secrets. They're, they're going to go download it. They're going, to go, they're going to go through all the challenges and solve them. What's the solution in general to secrets management? They're like, what are, what are you recommending? And Ben, I'm going to come to you first here. Like, what, what are you going to tell me as somebody who's like, okay, I didn't really understand this problem before we started this. I went and downloaded wrong secrets. I went through the challenges. I, fig- I understand the problem now. What's the, what do I need to do to make sure I don't have these problems? Like from a, from a high level perspective in my projects. Right. Yeah. So first off, I'd say store the secrets in a safe place. Uh, so use a specialized tool for the job. Um, any secrets manager, maybe even a password manager, if it's for your personal secrets, for example, use something like one password, last pass, uh, what not key pass. Um, and then um, ensure that every secret has a, a certain blast radius. So if it gets compromised, uh, it's not everything uh, at at once that goes. Um, that's that's really two highlights. I would also say that for um, automated stuff or um, things that is easy to rotate making things temporal and really using temporary credentials um, is really important leverage to those tools like um, um, i mean every cloud provider for example has uh, some way of providing temporary access to part of the code that's running inside it be it via roles be it via managed identities be it via a service account and these things don't need hard-coded keys stored. Um, they just don't need it um, unless they really can't uh, run inside said cloud environment. And maybe you have to work in an IoT uh, uh, setup and you need certificates or something to authenticate the cloud. You don't need those things hard-coded. Um, so that's the three top three things I would uh, Okay. Jerome, what would you add on top of that as far as advice for people that are thinking, hey, I'm going to go solve, I need to solve this now for my entire organization? Um, 
So add, so first of all, do what Ben said. I think that's very solid advice. Um, to add on top of that, um, make sure your secrets management is part of a threat model. If you haven't done threat modeling first, look upon that. Uh, I'm pretty sure there were already quite some cool episodes on threat modeling on this podcast as well. So listen to that. Try to get resources, get in, get in there, try to understand how things work, try to apply it yourself. Um, uh, the next one will be add enough metadata to the secret so that your, when your replace, your, your replacement or the later you, uh, after you woke up again, the next day still understands what the secret is about and be ready to move the secret because there's so many solutions on where you can store the secret and it's not, um, uh, it's not all set in stone because organizations move. So will your secrets management, make sure that you then understand whether that secret should move or not at all. Um, and last but not least, make sure you have your accounting in place. So, uh, make sure you can log when somebody accessed the secret, um, and make sure you can also understand who that was. So if some MPA starts hitting it, it should be nice to understand who called the MPA in the first place and that the MPA still actually has some sort of, um, um, metadata while calling the actual secrets management solution, telling who invoked the MPA, if you really want to go that route. So make sure it's always personalized. It's always locked. So at least you know what's happening. And the moment somebody is touching something that's not supposed to be touched, hey, at least you know by now. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, most of that actually has also been uh, published in a blog by Ben and me, uh, which might be nice to uh, pick up on, uh, upon. And we'll, uh, we can possibly share that link uh, on that blog uh, with 10 takeaways uh, for secrets management. Yeah, definitely. We, we can add that to the show notes so that our listeners can go uh, read that in more depth as far as how they can how they can solve this problem because it is fun to try to hack on things and find solve challenges but we also want to see our industry get better at just managing secrets in general like i'd love to to not be talking about this five years from now but i have a feeling we probably are going to be still talking about it uh, but it'd be great if we were in a world where you know that wasn't an issue so um any final then coming to you first any final kind of call to action or key takeaway that you want to give the audience you want to give them this is your time to give them homework if you want i don't know if they do it i have no idea but um, this is the moment where you can give them a homework assignment if you want to yeah look for anything that you have hard coded and uh rotate that and get rid of it try to make uh, make it somewhere safe store it somewhere safely um, get rid of those hard coded secrets, please. Your own anything that yeah, it's tough to add on top of that. That's, that's pretty solid advice, but any, any key takeaway or final takeaway from you? Definitely. So, um, uh, as our project one secrets is very young, we would love to get your feedback. So get in touch with us. If you like it, start a project on GitHub. If you don't like it at all, please tell us why. So we can maybe improve it in a way that it becomes more explainable because this is an issue that goes through all layers of the organization, but we totally understand that we're not reaching out to everybody yet in the way how the content is written. So we're really looking for feedback from you, uh, uh, from all of your listeners, basically. Um, you can contact us in various ways. Just check the GitHub uh, link that will be added to the podcast and uh, get in touch with us. We would love to listen and uh, and learn from you, basically. Well, ben, your own, thank you for your efforts in putting this project together. And I know there's some other contributors out there. So thank you to everybody who's contributed to this project. And, you know, I'm always just amazed by people in the OWASP community. Because, and, and I try to say this all the time so people know, like, you guys aren't getting paid for this. You're doing this in, in your free time because you want to move our industry forward. And so, you know, I appreciate that. And I'm, I thank you for that. And to all the contributors who are working on this project as well, thank you for the hours and time they're putting into this to help make our industry better. And so um, can't wait to see what project you guys come up with next. So thanks for the time. Thanks for having us. Thank you so much.